it's a great pleasure to introduce Mark Shapley. Um, these series of three presentations by Bob Shapley are really in reverse order of the normal. And so the introductions will also be similar, starting from very, very short to in between to a longer one on Tuesday. So you'll really only find out who he is on Tuesday before this. <laughs> the hell of lecture. The former part is uh, Bob is uh, Natalie Kuhn Spencer, professor of sciences at NYU Center for Neurosciences. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor at the Courant Institute of Mathematics at NYU. Uh, Bob uh, was uh, educated his BA is from Harvard in physics, and then he moved to the Rockefeller Institute where he did his uh, PhD in uh, neurobiology uh, at the lab of Kepra Hartline, uh, won a Nobel Prize for reasons you'll find out today uh, or not. Uh, he then did uh, postdocs at uh, Everson at Northwestern at, uh, with uh, Christina and Ross Kugel and at Cambridge University. Uh, with Fergus Campbell. With Fergus Campbell. Uh, he then returned to Rockefeller, uh, uh, where he opened his lab um, against all the principles of Rockefeller working on invertebrates. He started a vertebrate uh, lab. And uh, a year later, actually, I came and did a postdoc with Bob, so we've known each other for many years. known as the Genius Award. So uh, Bob is actually a certified genius. <laughs> um, he later moved to uh, NYU to the Center of Europe France when that was uh, open. Uh, he's worked on a very wide variety of aspects of vision, uh, including things like psychophysics and modeling, but color perception, shape, motion, uh, mainly done um, throughout his uh, work on the physiology of different levels of the visual system and the latest period mainly on V1 and we're going to hear about V1. Uh, to my mind, Bob is not only a top-notch experimental researcher, he's a deep thinker who thinks through the scientific issues to get at their essence and then strikes at the heart of the matter to solve the important questions and derive the mechanisms underlying the observed phenomena. So it's worth listening carefully to the things that he will have to say both today and on Tuesday. It's been my honor and pleasure to have worked with Bob over yeah, a number of years. Uh, first, as I said, uh, postdoc in his lab and uh, working on nonlinearities, which Chaim mentioned uh, today in his presentation, uh, and uh, resulting in our now classic papers on the nonlinear properties of neurons uh, in the LGN. Um, in, and uh, he continued working then on. Uh, well, there were interactions between us uh, with Binational Science Foundation uh, grants, working on apparent motion, perceptual learning, top-down effects that Bob uh, mentioned again today and that may Rob and I like to call the reverse hierarchy. Today, Bob is going to show us how the receptive field property, that the whole concept of receptive field initiated by <coughs> Kepler Hotline, is something that we have to put into question and uh, it's really the commonplace of uh, visual science and yet he's going to question and say is it useful or not. So thanks very much, Shaul. Uh, it's true that roughly speaking we've known each other for about half our lives. But, uh, crude approximation. Um, and um, um, I should also say that uh, I, um, uh, it's very uh, pleasant and, um, and uh, it's a personal pleasure for me to, to speak here also because uh, I've worked uh, with Shell and also with Heim on Binational Science Foundation sponsored research which uh, I uh, have always found to be both um, stimulating and provocative, and uh, uh, the interactions with both of these men. And uh, it's produced some nice research, too, over the years. Um, so what, um, what I'm doing today, uh, it was meant to be kind of a, a more theoretical talk than the Heller Lecture on Tuesday, uh, was to try to get at, at some fundamental concept that I think is important for understanding 
the brain and to examine it and to see what's uh, going on there. Uh, and the receptive field concept, I think, um, from my observation and from hearing people talk, uh, seems to be one of these fundamental ideas that um, um, can't be dislodged or is so it's like ingrained in our way of thinking um, in spite of uh, evidence against it. Um, uh, there's a very great uh, insight into modern politics, but also into science generally, that was um, achieved by the comedian Stephen Colbert when he invented the concept of truthiness. That is to say, uh, the concept of something which uh, sounds truthful and is very persuasive um, and that no amount of evidence can dislodge. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a concept that's truthy. And um, uh, the receptive field is something like that. There's, I, I've, I've pointed out other examples of truthiness in the literature uh, in respect to color, and we'll get to that on Tuesday. But um, the receptive field is really a fundamental uh, example of it. And um, this is all by way of just introduction. I f have felt that um, in trying to study issues in the um, function of the cerebral cortex, like orientation selectivity, or spatial frequency selectivity, or color uh, so selectivity. Whoops. Um, um, I've come up again and again against this uh, notion that the fundamental idea underneath them, that what really is, is motivating um, uh, people, is the idea that the receptive field can explain everything. And um, so anyway, um, we were doing experiments, um, we being Shuni and Dajun and me. Uh, they were doing most of the experiments, truthfully. Um, helped them a little. But, um, and we were trying to um, actually map out uh, the receptive fields in different layers of the cortex. And this was partly um, a result of a response to um, a lecture something like the one that Heim just gave us a little while ago. He gave it to me personally saying, why don't you give us more data about receptive fields in the cortex? You don't, we don't know what it is in, in layer one or two or three or four. And, and I took it to heart because I think it was a very valid point that, that people had talked about what actually was present in the cortex, but, um, uh, but vaguely and not really specifically about what were the differences and what were the exact parameters and what, what did they look like and so on. And I think it was at that time, this was quite a while ago now, um, it was motivated by the same notion that if we understood the receptive fields, we would understand the function of these cells in different layers. And what we found, what Shuni and Dajun uh, found when we were doing this thing, is that in fact, uh, the whole idea needed to be re-examined. So that's what I'm, this is all by way of introduction to where we got to where we are. And also that this was all done, work done in, in our lab. A and the experiments are, I'm gonna be talking about are all our experiments were all done on, in monkey V1 uh, using microelectrode recording in a lightly anesthetized animal. And we can talk about that at the end if you want to get into anesthetized versus awake. But in, anyway, the ph phenomenology and the distribution of properties of neurons in, this, in these animals is very well understood. So we, that's where we started from. Um, okay, so what we were examining what was this idea of the receptive field hypothesis. Uh, and actually, Heim covered this to some extent in his talk earlier, that neurons can be characterized as quasi-linear spatiotemporal filters, and all we need to know about the sensory cortex is the ensemble of receptive fields mapped with elemental atoms of perception, like spots or bars or gratings. And once we determine those, those um, uh, uh, once we determine the, the ensemble of receptive fields, we know everything there needs to be known about the sensory cortex because we could synthesize the response of the cortex to anything else from this knowledge. That's the, that's the receptive field hypothesis. I'm stating it in a strong form. And what I'm going to tell you is that this receptive field hypothesis, the RFH, unravels as we travel from the input layers to the output layers in V1 cortex. So here is a point that I w want to make another uh, fundamental introductory point, and that is that um, our motivation, and this was, I mentioned this in connection with the original motivation also, was to study cells in different layers because we had good evidence that they were different from each other. There was 
there was prior evidence from our group and others that, that and the known anatomy also suggested that different layers should have different functions and uh, should have different receptive fields, perhaps. And so we were looking for the receptive field properties as a function of depth in the cortex and, and layer laminar identification. And what we found was that the hypothesis that we were examining, uh, we, were, we thought we were just going to measure parameters that all fit this hypothesis. And what we found was actually that the hypothesis uh, disintegrated when we went away from the input layers. And that's what I'm going to show you. So, yes? Uh, well, um, all I can say is that everyone acts as if that's all you need to do. But, so, the, the, it's, uh, uh, not, so that's actually, I think, the essence of a truthy kind of statement, which is that uh, in spite of all that we, need, that we know, um, people still act and, and think, I can tell you they think this way, that, um, that all we need to do is to uh, understand the, um, uh, the ensemble of receptive fields. And the receptive fields basically characterize uh, what the population of neurons would be doing. Um, and in fact, I would say, um, yeah, I mean, um, the, um, in any case, this is the statement of the hypothesis that we're going to examine. Whatever, whether people should have that hypothesis or not uh, is sort of a secondary question. Um, but I, I, I claim to you that in fact, many people do, uh, whether they should or not. Um, okay, now, um, the receptive field hypothesis actually derived from the work of Hartline, uh, who studied receptive fields. He introduced the, the term, actually, into visual neurophysiology in the study of retinal ganglion cells. He, uh, he was, the truth is that, actually, the famous Lord Adrian had, had uh, suggested the idea of receptive fields, but Hartline was the first one who actually measured it in single neurons. He measured single receptive fields in retinal ganglion cells of something like 10 different species. Uh, that, most of the data that are shown are from frogs, but he did it in alligators and mud puppies and all kinds of animals, newts, the, the amphibian kind of newts, and uh, other kinds. And um, so, uh, and he was my PhD advisor, so this is a bit of a parasite uh, operation. And, um, 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 but it was a great concept, and in fact, in the retina, it's, a, it's very, very valuable, as I'll show you. And then the other uh, great discoverer and contributor to the power of the receptive field hypothesis was Horace Barlow. Who dis so this is a photograph of Horace Barlow in, in uh, middle age. Uh, he discovered, he, when he, I don't have a photograph of how he looked when he discovered uh, uh, receptive field surrounds. But anyway, um, and he, um, he expanded Hartline's notion to include the idea of a center surround organization and an antagonistic surround. And indeed, um, the power of the, of the receptive field hypothesis is particularly uh, illustrated in the work of Enroth, Kugel, and Robson. This is a slide from their work where uh, they showed that, in fact, um, you could account for the center surround organization as diagrammed here in terms of overlapping mechanisms, a, a, a center mechanism which could be fit with a Gaussian profile and a surround mechanism that could also be fit with a Gaussian profile, but with an expanded spatial scale. And then the difference between these two mechanisms, conceived of as uh, linear spatial filters, um, the, the different outputs of these linear spatial filters combined together would give you the spatial receptive field organization of, the, um, of a retinal ganglion cell. And it works very well. And in fact, you can predict things like the spatial filtering characteristics of such a retinal ganglion cell. So for instance, if you take a center and surround, so here's the, the center is the fine dashed, it's represented in this cartoon as a fine dashed curve, and the surround is a coarse dashed curve, and if you take the difference between them, you get this Mexican hat in space, the sort of the original Mexican hat. Um, and then if you take that Mexican hat, receptive field, this is a is distance on the retina, and you have different patterns put on it. These are different profiles of sinusoidal grading patterns of different spatial frequency, spatial frequency one, two, and three, you can actually predict from this center surround organization what should be the spatial frequency response or contrast sensitivity as a function of spatial frequency. And so spatial frequency one maps to here, and spatial frequency two maps to here, 
in spatial frequency three maps to here. And you can see that spatial frequency three is only effective in driving the center. So only the center's spatial frequency response contributes to the total cell response. And at, at number two, both center and surround, there's a little bit of surround. It's weaker, but it's there. And there's some center, and the difference between them gives you this response. And then at the lowest spatial frequency, there's a lot of surround, and there's in the center, they, you subtract them together, and you get a much weaker response. This is on a log scale. So if they're almost the same, and you subtract them, you get like one-tenth the, um, the strength, and so it's much weaker. And so center surround antagonism in space maps into spatial filtering and spatial frequency, and it all works very well, and you can do lots of nice quantitative experiments, and the receptive field hypothesis works great. So everything's fine and dandy, and this actually extends to the lateral geniculate nucleus, so it's not just the retina, but also in the LGN, you can also get very good fits with the receptive field hypothesis. So the problem comes when you go to the cortex. So people just naturally assume, since Hartline and Barlow and all these guys, um, were so successful in studying um, receptive fields in the retina, uh, and Ross Kugel and Robson and so on, why not keep on going into the cortex? So Huber and Weasel did this, and they just basically said, well, you could manu from the receptive fields in the geniculate, you could map out receptive fields in the cortex, which will be elongated, and they'll just be the sum of these, uh, these geniculate cells, which have these receptive fields. If you just sum them up, you'll get an elongated receptive field like the ones that they saw or they thought they saw in the cortex. And uh, later experiments by Reed and Alonzo and by Furster, they, and if you don't know them, it isn't worth going into it, but these experiments were taken to support this idea that you could get a receptive field in the cortex that was just sort of like the receptive fields you see in the retina. And these were made respectable by lots of people who did quantitative experiments and you know, made the receptive field hypothesis expect respectable by doing reverse correlation and mapping out the receptive fields in the cortex. Uh, so you, so, you, know, um, you can easily see that if you, if you uh, do a reverse correlation of uh, spots in the, receptive in the visual field, this is visual space, 0 to 5 degrees and 0 to 5 degrees. So it's two-dimensional visual space in the, in the world. You can map out uh, visual receptive fields, and this is like a schematic of them, in the cortex that are different from the ones in the lateral geniculate nucleus, which are more round. In the cortex, they're more elongated. And you can sort of explain, you can explain cortical properties in terms of receptive fields. So it's, again, the receptive field hypothesis is being used to explain uh, properties of neurons. And to summarize, uh, this, is, this is a didactic slide showing what it is that people have done. They, so Hubel and Weasel used receptive fields to explain the properties of so-called simple and complex cells. Uh, simple cells had adjacent fields that were responsive to different contrast polarity, or they might have three subfields with, with different polarities. And then going through the LN model, which Shaheim also discussed, uh, could give you uh, responses of neurons. And Carandini et al. Uh, have a summary uh, review paper where they say one of the models that sort of needs to be tested is this LN model, although there's lots of evidence against it, as Murak was saying. Um, but it's still, the receptive field hypothesis was kind of embodied in this sort of scheme. Um, and as Heim pointed out, this idea of this uh, receptive field has been challenged by recent results uh, that indicate that V1 receptive fields vary with stimulus ensembles. So there's the Sharpie results and the David and Gallant results, and Jonathan Victor has some stuff about it, and we also looked at natural images, and they were a little different. The thing is that practically all of these results, that all of them summarized here, which I agree with, they're all correct, I believe they're wonderful, they all showed fairly small effects, every single last one of them. The, 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 the differences between, um, for instance, in Sharpie, what's, you know, this is the difference. This is the kind of difference that you see. It gets a little narrower. Uh, the, 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 one, one subregion gets a little shorter. Um, in David et al.'s results and also in Victor et al.'s results, there are definite changes in receptive fields with different stimuli, but um, um, the effects are all small. So the people who believed you know, um, that there's no reason to give up this very good explanatory framework because of these small discrepancies might say, well, it's true. There may be some small modulations of the receptive field, but um, it's not a big effect. It isn't really important for perception. It isn't really important for neurophysiology. It'll be some kind of tweak that we'll have to put in some nonlinearity someplace or other. Can I make a comment? Sure. Uh, one question is uh, whether the receptive fields uh, arrive by fitting different ensembles. 
are similar to each other. But another question is, even if we take the best conceptive field, how much of the variance of the response... Yes, I agree. So I, I agree. But I, I would say, though, that I, I claim, which we can examine later, that um, these results didn't have such a big effect on the field because the discrepancies were not very big. That's my claim. And uh, it's true that they were quantitative effects. I'm not saying that they were zero. And in fact, they're important. And, and maybe other people made more of them uh, than all the people that I've talked to. But in general, I would say that um, 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 we, there wasn't um, a real breakdown of the receptive field hypothesis, even though there were a lot of challenges to it. And I, I throw in the stimulus invariant business here because that is really the crux of the issue. If there's a receptive field, the only point, it only is of explanatory power if it's the same receptive field no, no matter what the stimulus ensemble is that you're putting on the, on the, uh, on the presenting it to the eye. If, if, depending on whatever stimulus you put on, the mapping from the outside world to the neural response changes, then the idea of receptive field is sort of so plastic that it's useless. You need, that is to say, you need an invariant representation of the mapping from the outside world to the neuron's response in order for the receptive field hypothesis to have content. That's the notion. So, um, so as I said, our research was motivated by uh, a program of research about laminar analysis. And we're using these uh, microelectrode recordings. They're multi-electrode, but it's microelectrodes. There's a small number of microelectrodes to probe the different functions of the cortical laminate. Um, so we're actually looking in V1 of monkeys. Like here's monkeys and here's humans. They're not, they're not the scale. They're different scales. But, uh, and um, in the monkey, we're basically looking at, at, the, at the cerebral cortex and the fact that it's a laminated structure and that there are different laminae. Obviously, just by looking at it, you can see there are different densities of cells. The question is whether this has functional significance. And there's a lot of feeling in the field that it does have functional significance. And of course, I'm going to show you that it does. Um, but um, from the anatomy, you should expect that there might be functional differences between layers because, in fact, different layers get different inputs. So for instance, 4C alpha and 4C beta get the main parvo and magno inputs, 4C beta getting parvo input and 4C alpha magno input, where the 4C beta is getting mainly the input from the LGN that's carrying signals of that red-green color. Uh, the 4C alpha is getting input from the geniculate that's carrying signals about uh, black and white contrast and, and high speed uh, information. The conio cells, which are carrying mainly blue-yellow information, project up to lower layer 3 and to four, this thin layer 4A. Four, four, four um, and then within the cortex, uh, layer 4B gets a very large input from 4C alpha. And although it's indicated in the diagram that it gets an input from 4C beta, that's really rather weak. So if we drew it in terms of scale, this would be a very thin arrow, and these would be ra rather stout arrows. And then uh, 4B projects up to layer 3, and 4C alpha and 4C beta also project up to layer 3B. And then from 3B, there's input up from 3B up to 3A, and so and it's into layer 2. So there's, there's lots of projections, and the cells up here are getting input of, of a couple of relays from uh, 4C alpha, 4C beta, and 4B and also some uh, direct input from the coniocellular cells from the geniculate. Uh, and it's also known that these different layers have different functions in terms of where they go. What's, what's, their, what's the readout from V1? So there isn't much readout from 4C alpha and 4C beta, but there's a lot of readout from 4B. This has a major projection to V2 and also to uh, V5 or MT. Uh, layers 2 and 3 have a very massive projection into V2. Layer 5 and layer 6, on the other hand, layer 5 is the main output to the, the superior colliculus and is supposed to have some role in the generation and control of eye movements. And layer 6 has a descending input to multiple structures, including the lateral geniculus nucleus. So these are projections to subcortical sites. These are projections up here, 2, 3, and 4B, to, um, to cortical cortical. Uh, and with 2, 3, I should say, so that's of main importance I want to say later. Layer 2 and 3 have a very important function because they are the major input to the ventral stream in the monkey and presumably in humans also where you see 
uh, uh, pattern recognition and pattern formation is mainly, the signals that these neurons carry are mainly involved in that. Okay. So now, I'll just show you what uh, a histological recovery looks like of the recordings that we did. So we did multiple electrodes. You can't see so on the slide, but in the cartoon, there, there were multiple electrodes going in, in parallel. We tried to keep them going more or less at the same depth in the cortex. And then by standard lesioning techniques, we could recover, I don't know if you can see the lesions here, and here, and here, we could recover the tracks and therefore the addresses of where we record. So there aren't many people who try to use these. This is using a, a Thomas multi-electrode system from uh, Germany. And there aren't that many people who have tried to use this system to do this kind of technique because it's such a pain in the neck to uh, mount the electrodes into the electrode, the multiple electrode holder. And people were afraid if they passed current, they'd break the electrodes. Um, and um, so there hasn't been much of this kind of lesion recovery work done in um, using the Thomas system in uh, mammalian cortex. It turns out that a lot of the worry about breaking the electrodes by passing current and, and using them to make lesions was based on experience with electrodes that were made in Britain. Uh, but the Thomas system is made in Germany, and all the electrodes are made in Germany. And it turns out that with the Thomas electrodes, you can pass as much current to them as you like, and they're very robust. That nothing happens to them. In fact, they may get a little better. Um, so we found that actually passing direct current through these electrodes is great, and we can do terrific um, recovery. And the point of the slide is just to say that we know where the cells were. So when I tell you later, this is in layer 3 or this is in layer 4 C alpha and so on, uh, we knew where we were and um, uh, by after the experiment, I mean, after, uh, um, after the animal was um, sacrificed and the histology was done. The experiments were done, uh, the experiments I'm going to talk about uh, mainly, yes, yeah, so or at least the first series of experiments were done with these multiple electrodes. And basically the reason we did them, the, way, the reason we did these experiments the way we did them is that we needed to get, with these multiple electrodes in the brain, we needed to map out where their uh, visual fields were located. And since they were not all the same place, we wanted to be able to map them all simultaneously and get an idea of where we were recording across the visual field. So we used reverse correlation with um, either gradings, so-called Hartley subspace stimuli, but these are just a select set of grading stimuli of particular orientation spatial frequencies. Uh, and, um, or we use sparse noise, meaning uh, ev on every frame a single pixel of, uh, light, uh, uh, of visual stimulus from uh, above a gray background, either above or below. So we used uh, either black pixels or uh, white pixels or black pixels, and they were put in random locations. Here, the spatial frequencies and orientations were chosen randomly at a rapid rate, something like uh, 50 hertz. Uh, sorry, at something like, um, sorry. These were done at 50 hertz, and this was done at about uh, 40 hertz, just to get signal to noise. Um, the difference is immaterial, as you'll see. The, the temporal characteristics are not the crucial ones. Um, reverse correlation is just done by you know, taking a spike and looking back in the stimulus stream to find out which pattern uh, was there before the spike and then just adding it into a summed pattern. And the integrated pattern then is the map uh, that drives that neuron. And you can get perfectly good predictions of what you get with, with these um, gratings or with sparse noise. Uh, basically, if you had this a re receptive field hypothesis as it's commonly understood, you should get the same answer using both stimuli. You, when, you, when you do the reverse correlation experiment, it should give you pretty much the same answer. Um, and, you know, there's no content here. Uh, these things both could be viewed as experimental movies. Uh, the stimulus looks like, you know, a continuous stream of, of meaningless uh, images. Um, sometimes I try to justify this by saying that we're actually, our laboratory is located around the corner from the NYU Film School, which is well known for experimental cinema. And so this is an extremely experimental um, uh, film where there's um, a lot of action but no plot. So, um, uh, so anyway, um, so the, the neurons are looking at these movies and what they do is actually generate a response movie and here's the response movie, which is a series of um, images at different time offsets uh, indicating what was the average pattern that preceded the spike uh, uh, at that time. And, um, and there's usually some time offset where there's a, a, a robust image pattern. Um, and this can be described by the spatial variance of this pattern. 
So here's the spatial variance of the pattern as a function of time. And you can make a signal-to-noise ratio measurement, which is the variance of the pattern at its optimal time divided by the variance at early times when the stimulus is having no effect. And then that ratio will give you the signal-to-noise. And you can get pretty good signal-to-noise. So, so these images, are, as you, this is a good example of one that has a quite robust signal-to-noise. And you, I'll show you some signal-to-noise data later, so just to give you an idea. So we're, we're generating pretty good uh, results. And then for the purposes of the talk, I'm just going to show results at the peak time, a snapshot. But indeed, these data do repay more data analysis than we've done involving the spatiotemporal aspect. I'm, so I'm not saying that we've completed the job, but we already have enough information that, that there's some issue. Is there a question? I'd be glad to answer a question. Question. Okay, so this is, this is position in space. So this is the movie, sorry, the movie images, each of them cover a certain position in space, something like four by four degrees. And then it's 144 pixels or something. So there's 12 by 12 in each one. So, and then this, this picture here is on that same grid, the map of the response in terms of the, uh, the average, uh, reverse correlated average as a function of time uh, bef um, before the spike. So this is, uh, so, th so this peak is occurring something like 50 milliseconds. That means the pattern that was 50 milliseconds before the spike had the biggest influence on the spiking of the neuron. Okay? And this is the map of the average pattern that had that, that effect. Okay? Thanks for asking, because I, I want to clarify so you understand what I'm talking about. Um, right. So this is, a, this is actually a map derived from the grading pattern. Uh, you can do the same thing with the dots, you know, exactly the same uh, story. Okay? Is that, is, okay. So, um, so the results are, oh, got to speed up a bit. The results are, in layer 4C, you can compare the peak, so I'm just showing the peak ones, the peak uh, map, that, that is the map at the peak time for three different neurons, example one, example two, example three, uh, for the grading patterns and for the dots, for the, the so-called sparse noise. And there's pretty good agreement. There, it's not perfect. So this amount of disagreement is a sort of, this amount of disagreement is the kind of disagreement that uh, other people like Sharpie made a big deal about. But this is about the kind of, some, this is no disagreement really. They're, they're very good, good agreements. Here there's some disagreement. Here this is pretty good agreement also. This is layer 4C. So 4C, remember, are the two subdivisions that are getting input from the thalamus from the parvo and magna layers. These are the input layer neurons, right? 4C, that's the input layer. Like, in, like layer 4 in, in other cortices. Um, in layer 2, 3, you get a different picture. So this is really the essence of the story, which is that here are three different neurons. These are the grading maps. These are the sparse noise maps. And you see what happens is that the grading map and the sparse noise map don't look anything like each other. That is to say, it's not like there's a quantitative difference. They just don't look anything. Like these, these particularly look, they all three look very blob-like in response to the um, uh, sparse noise. In response to the gratings, they have the sort of same Gabor-like uh, structure, the, uh, very elongated ones, actually, in layer 2, 3, m much longer than in, uh, in the input layers. Um, and uh, the other thing I should say is that I didn't mention, but I'll, 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 the, the key here is that when it says minus 1, what it means is that it fired spikes when there was a dark pixel or a dark region in this location. And it's red. Where it's red, it means that it fired spikes when there was a bright region in this location. So this is like an on region and an off region, okay? Is there a contrast? Sorry. Is there a contrast? Uh, so I'm going to, uh, here everything was really as high contrast as we could use. Um, um, and, um, but, um, so, and these, re I'm going to get to it later, but these responses are actually quite robust. It's not like they're near threshold and these are above threshold. Uh, um, but we haven't ex we haven't gone to low to very low contrast. Um, we're sort of trying to we were trying to get signal to noise out of this. So indeed, um, uh, we didn't explore contrast. So that's the short answer. <laughs> um, but but I wanted to say that, that these these receptive fields, which are elongated, sort of have the typical picture that you'd expect in the re receptive field hypothesis for visual cortex. They should you think that these would be consistent with orientation tuning and orientation selectivity. In the same neurons, mapping them with dots, you get these maps which actually have almost no predictable orientation selectivity at all. 
they're almost round or you know very weak uh, preference for any orientation. Um, and we verified that later. Uh, I think I'll get to that. But I just wanted to make the, oh, and I, the other thing I, I you interrupted me. I was going to say this this what this indicates is that the absence of red down here indicates that in these cells, in these examples, all of these cells were basically being excited only by the black pixels. And I'm going to make a big deal about that later. Uh, whereas here, with the gratings, basically you found regions that were consistent with an on region or an off region and so on. Yeah. So they're roughly in the same location, yeah, yeah with the same center of gravity, and 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 um, um, uh, the truth is that we didn't really, in detail, examine deviations because the problem with that is that um, you always have to worry in, in these experiments, even though we we're doing everything we can to minimize them about eye movements. And so what we did when we did all the comparisons, which I'll show you quantitatively, we actually corrected for any, DC, any translational offset. So, uh, so th th when we do comparisons of shape of the receptive fields, we're only going to be looking at uh, shape parameters, not anything to do with translation. Now, there may be translational changes as well, uh, which are hard to, um, harder to control against eye movements. So we haven't really tried to do that. Yeah, sure. Uh, are these receptive fields on the top corrected for stimulus correlation? Uh, there are no stimulus correlations, so these are chosen to be uh, orthogonal sets. So th this, th I didn't say that, so you have a very reasonable question, but these sets are supposed to be orthogonal to each other, so, that, so, that, so that there's, no, there's no dot product at all. So that's why this it doesn't have some of the problems of, of correlation of the images. These are purely, um, um, they're, they're kosher, as the goes, if you're fighting the expression. Um, um, so, um, uh, right. Now, so what we did was to try to, and I was, I was anticipating my answer, the next slide in my answer to you. We tried to get a quantitative estimate of how similar or dissimilar the neurons were by using what other people have used, which is the so-called similarity index, which is basically just a dot product of the, of the receptive fields considered as vectors. And, whoops. And so this is just obviously taking a dot product. And then normalizing by the length. So we're getting like a, like a, uh, a normalized dot product, so like a cosine function between the two vectors. And, um, um, and what we see is that, um, well, there's an interesting uh, correlation with location. So this is the receptive field similarity index. I didn't say, but sorry, uh, I'll say it here, that the index uh, goes between 0 and 1. 1 means that they're exactly the same receptive field except for a scale factor. Uh, and zero means that they're orthogonal to each other. They're completely independent. Uh, a minus one would mean that the th they were the same shape but inverted in polarity, for instance. So zero means that they're as different as they could be, that is to say they're orthogonal. Um, and this is the depth. So at each dot here is a single neuron. So I should say, for most of this talk, we're going to be occupied, and the talk is coming to an end, so it's for almost all of it. It's about single unit analysis. but. Um, we have some, multi, some population stuff at the end if I have time. So these are all single units. This is a, each one is a single cell whose address we verified with this mapping technique. And then there's this quantitative measurement of the filled ones versus the open ones. So the open ones are what are usually called simple cells, where uh, a modulation index, uh, which measures how, how much the cell is modulated by modulation of the input, uh, uh, is greater than one. And if it's less than one, this is what nor normally we would call complex cells, where there's n less modulation of the cell's firing rate by the modulation of the input. And so the filled circles are the complex cells. The open circles are what are traditionally called simple cells. And then they're mapped across the layers, so we know where each of them lives. So here's 4C, and the simple cells and the complex cells here. And then here's 2, 3, and the simple cells and the complex cells here. And what you see, you know, is that there's a lot of variation, there's a lot of noise. But overall, in the upper layers, the similarity index, you could put it like an average, that it's somewhere around 0.2 to 0.3. I don't know the exact number, but it's, it's around, point, say, 0.3, generously. And um, um, I have more quantitation of it. And um, that's very dissimilar. So, you know, Sharpie and, was up here. And uh, Jonathan Victor also was up here. And uh, with David and Gallant and their work, um, 
uh, the stuff that Haim presented before. I really can't say because uh, of technical difficulties where they were, uh, and so I'd rather not include them in the, in, the com in the comparisons. But a lot of the earlier work had suggested that there were differences, and that's why I said that they were dismissed somewhat because the effects were smaller. Here, they're, there's, they're almost as different as they could be because you're going from something which is, looks like a Gabor function to something which looks like, looks like a Gaussian blob. So it's really different. And there is a very big laminar dependence because there's, there's this bulge in 4C and in 4B also out to larger values of similarity. But in layer 2, 3 particularly, and in 5, 6, the data are, are not as robust, are not as dense because uh, we spent a lot of time up here and so we always got down here late. But anyway, um, um, uh, there, there seems to be a, a real trend of li like this. And it's more evident if you just look at the simple cells. If you just look at the cells that are highly modulated by the stimulus, then um, you see uh, the effect. So here the simple cells and the complex cells are broken apart, and you see the, the distributions, histograms across the layers. And among the complex cells, there's less laminar variation. But in the simple cells, you see there's this big clump over here in 4C and this group over here. And I have that separated even more into just simple cells, just to make the point, that there's a big difference between 4C and 2,3 in the degree of similarity. Um, there's pretty good similarity, although, as I said, other people would say this is a big difference, but compared to what's going on in 2,3, it's a gigantic, um, uh, in 2,3, there's a big, huge difference. In, and indeed, the mode is around, you know, 0.3. Um, all right. OK. Um, and, uh, I just wanted to say, when, when I present these results, often at this point, people say, uh, well, is it just because the stimuli are too weak when you use sparse noise? So uh, this is the slide that I used to answer that question, which hasn't been asked, but I'll answer it anyway, which is that, in fact, the signal to noise ratio for the Hartley, that is the gratings, and for the sparse noise, actually, in the upper layers, um, they have a different distribution. The, the, the signal to noise ratio for the Hartleys are something, somewhere between two and three, but the signal to noise ratio for the sparse noise varies between one all the way up to ten. So there is, and there's no real uh, clear uh, reduction in the signal to noise ratio of sparse noise responses versus um, versus gratings. In 4C, they actually are much more correlated, and uh, so th there there doesn't seem to be much difference. Uh, so. This is to show that you can't explain the results simply in terms of the fact that somehow there's a threshold and the responses to the dots are weaker. In fact, sometimes the responses to the dots are much stronger. So, um, uh, yes? Well, you know, I agree with you that that's what's happening, but, but that's not explained by the receptive field hypothesis. That is, you know, when you say, when you see, and if you see, and something like that, we're, in, we're, we're imposing some order that involves more intelligence than the receptive field hypothesis. That's all I'm saying. And so I, I don't disagree with you, but, but I, in agreeing with you, we have to go beyond these simple notions. That's... Yes. Well, you know, that's their problem. I don't know why. I, I, I line on what I'm saying is I don't think that's true in general. I mean, here's layer 4C in the monkey. We're presenting dots and we're presenting gratings, and, you know, there's no difference. So I don't, if they had a trouble, you know, you know who knows what they were doing. I, there are a lot of technical reasons why that might have happened in their case. Uh, um, we were talking about this at lunch, about the optics. You know, there are a lot of things that, that were done that were not done perfectly, Okay. But when we do them as good as we can do it now in the 21st century, in fact, there's no difference between dots and gratings in the input layer. But there's a big difference uh, in the output, output layers, okay? Uh, and I'm not here to try to explain all of Hubel and Weasel's results that we can't replicate, okay? Um, I just want to say that you don't need to just use these two kinds of stimuli. You can also use white noise or uh, spatiotemporal M sequences, and you can do the same kind of mapping in layer four and layer two, three. And um, the, these are examples. Um, 
the bottom line is that you get a similar picture that if you compare the gratings with the white noise, there's more similarity. So it's not down to 0.3, it's more like 0.5. Uh, and there's, there's the difference between layer 2, 3 and layer 4C is less, although there is a, a quantitative difference. Um, um, so here uh, you can see the difference in the histograms. But it's not as great as it is with the sparse noise. Uh, and uh, this is the sparse noise in the, in the uh, same experiment. So um, you can, there are other stimulus ensembles you can use and get similar sorts of uh, discrepancies. Um, OK. I, uh, I'm just going to try to finish up by saying a few things about the way in which the um, receptive field hypothesis fails. It fails in a surprising way, which is that, uh, in particular, in the responses to black and white spots in the sparse noise, you see unequal responses in layer 2, 3, which you don't see in, in layer 4C. Um, and so in layer 4C, you get you know, a lot equal amounts of uh, red and blue, mostly. But in layer 2, 3, as I showed you before, you get a lot of blue, it, which means a preference for black stimuli. So there's a, an emergence in the output layers of a preference for black stimuli. Um, the cortex is actually biased to respond better to black. And you can see this in some quantitative method. If we look at the, um, the, the signal to noise ratio for white versus black, um, it goes negative in the upper layers, the ratio of the signal to noise ratio for the log ratio of signal to noise for, of white to black uh, goes negative in the upper layers, whereas in the input layer it's close to zero. And the, the, the running average is indicated by this sort of black line. So there's, uh, and that's, you know, it's like, it, it doesn't look like much, but it's very significant. It's like uh, something like half a log unit. It's like a factor of three. So that's enormous. Um, that I define that as enormous. But it, it's a big difference, way out of the noise. Um, and if you look at the number of uh, neurons that can be classified as preferring black or white, there's this big change uh, going on between layer four where it's about 60% versus layer 2, 3, where it's about 90% um, uh, using sparse noise. Now, using, I'm going to skip through some data because I want to skip this, some stuff and go directly to the population measurements. So let me just go to this. So f the question is, can we understand what's going on here and why this is happening? So this is sort of like trying to understand why we're getting this um, very non, um, it's very nonlinear but it's very nonlinear in a specific way. We're, we're departing from the, um, from the simple uh, filtering scheme. And how does it happen? So what we tried to do, and this is the work that Da Junxing and Trini did using population measures, is to look at multi-unit spike activity. So to get away from single units, all the time we're measuring multi-unit activity. Occasionally we get single units, and that's what, what they used for the graphs up to now. But now we're going to use the multi-unit activity that we get every single place. Um, and, um, and we measure the, the correlation of the response to the uh, sparse noise of the multi-unit activity and uh, the, the correlation of response to white spots, uh, the correlation of the response to black spots. And you can't really see too well, unfortunately. See, what about this? Where's the, is this the light? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you can see it. But ba embedded in here, there are black as well as white uh, um, responses. And the black ones are higher. So these are, these are actually time courses at each of the pixels in their reverse correlation grid. So this is the grid of pixels, just like before. It's the same grid. It's now just doing multi-unit responses instead of reverse correlation with single spikes. And this is the time courses of the responses in each of the pixels. And it just shows you the white response, which is very salient to you because it's high contrast, and the black response, which is low contrast, you can't see, but it's actually larger in most places. And this is the summed average um, response to uh, white versus black. And you can just see the black response is larger for this particular site, which was in the upper layers. Um, and so you can take an, uh, a signal to noise ratio of the spatial maps of the multi-unit activity, as we did for the single unit activity, and map those. Um, across the cortex and map them as a function of time. And we get pictures like this. So this is time. This is depth in the cortex. And these are the raw uh, responses to the black pixels 
a function of depth and time, uh, and the color indicates the, signal -to -noise, the log of the signal-to-noise ratio going from zero when it's blue to 1.5 when it's red. So it's, okay, so this is like, uh, so this would be like 30. That's a very strong signal-to-noise ratio, and, and zero would be like uh, one. So it's, that's low. Um, and this is the pattern you get for black, and this is the pattern that you get for white. This is from the multi-unit activity, okay? And what you see is that in the input layers, there's a small difference. Uh, sorry, this is the, uh, this is 4C. Yes, this is 4C. This is 4B. In 4B, there's a little bit of difference. But in the upper layers, in 2, 3, there's a big difference between black and white. And if you um, take the um, uh, difference between the signal-to-noise ratios, uh, you get the difference between the log signal-to-noise ratios. You get this picture where there's a big um, advantage for black in the upper layers. And in the other layers, there's rather little difference. There's a little bit of advantage in 4B. In 4C alpha, actually, there's a little bit of, uh, it goes blue, meaning it's negative, meaning that, in fact, in 4C alpha, white pixels are a little bit more effective than black. And then in 4C beta, there's a little hint of a, of a and that, which is an important hint of um, an advantage for black over white. This finding of a little bit of advantage of white over black in the input layer for the Magno input to, to uh, V1 actually is consistent with some work done on retinal ganglion cells by E.J. Chichilnitsky in his lab, indicating that Magno cells may actually, there may be a slight bias towards uh, white uh, stimuli. But the, the parvo cells seem to be slightly biased towards black, and then this very small bias for black gets amplified. So, oh, I forgot, it's this one. No, that's the wrong one. Uh, there. Sorry. Sorry. Um, and so you can look at these signals as a function of time, uh, comparing the, the, uh, c the difference between the black and the white signals in different layers. And so, for instance, in 4C beta, the green, that's the green signal. In 2.3, that's the red signal. These are the multi-unit activities. And the blue signal, actually, I haven't shown you. We also measured the local field potential, and we could measure the evoked local field potential in uh, layer 2.3. And um, various things you can say, which is, for one thing, the, the, the 4C beta uh, effect is much smaller than the 2-3 effect. So there's, there's a big amplification of the black preference within the cortex. Um, second thing is that, uh, that there's a little bit of a delay in layer 2-3 compared to the input from layer 4C beta. And that the LFP and the 4C beta signals tend to track each other pretty well. But then the LFP in the upper layers has this prolonged a response and then second hump that you don't see at all in the input from, this is the input, you know, this is 4C beta activity, which must be the input from the wiring diagram to these upper layers. That's the only input, visual input that they get. So, um, um, and then this is the LFP in that layer, which is indicating that some of the synaptic currents in the, uh, in layer two, three are rising with the, uh, feed forward input from 4C beta, but then there's something else going on that pr prolongs them and then generates a secondary wave. Um, we don't have any explanation yet for this. We, I mean, we're, we're, that's something else to work on. Uh, but this prolongation we think is very significant and may be related to the great enhancement of the response in, in the multi-unit activity. Um, and the schemes that we suggest are that there's some sort of, um, and, and this has all been published, uh, so you can look it up, uh, but we suggest that, these, that this pattern of, of activation is consistent with a scheme where there's selective amplification of uh, black-related signals coming from uh, 4C beta into 2.3. And so there, there needs to be some kind of selectivity. It can't be uh, simply a passive uh, process. But in any case, um, the bottom line is, uh, getting back to the original line of the talk, is that, oh, sorry. Sorry, I forgot one other thing. That is, there are... Evi there is evidence in human visual perception and also visual responses that the same kind of preference for black stimuli obtains in humans. Some friends of mine a long time ago measured in the visual evoked potential uh, a bias for black squares, the response to black squares versus white squares in posterior cortex. It's a finding that I have to regretfully say I ignored for many years uh, and they were completely right all the time. Um, there's fMRI evidence that's unpublished so far 
that there are bigger bold signals in fMRI in V1 for black pixels uh, arranged in a kind of random manner versus white. Uh, there's psychophysical evidence from Charlie Chubb and his postdoc Nam on uh, the higher impact of black pixels in responding to the contrast of a texture. And it's well known that uh, everyone reads faster with black print on white background than with white print on black background, including uh, Chinese characters. Uh, but this could be all learned, of course. I mean, so that's why. But on the, in the case of the monkeys, uh, their their bias for black can't be due to the fact that they read too much uh, black print on white backgrounds. Um, there is some, there are some data in face recognition that indicate more than other areas of visual perception, there is a sensitivity to contrast polarity. And so we think that there may be, although there's no direct connection at all, uh, some relation between this finding in V1 and the requirements for face recognition, although that's strictly speculative. That's why there are the three question marks instead of just one. Um, but getting back to the original uh, theme of the talk, things look black for the receptive field hypothesis. That's supposed to be a joke. And um, um, it doesn't work very well outside layer 4C, which, which layer 4C is only really the input layers. Um, it doesn't work that great even in layer 4C. That is to say, there's significant dissimilarity even in layer 4C, even for the gratings. But it's already, I mean, the gratings and, and white noise. You see dissimilarity also with gratings and, and, uh, and sparse noise that are, um, that's, that's interesting. Um, the, the, the hypothesis fails in a surprising way, surprising to us anyway, which is that uh, black wins out in driving cells in layer 2-3. It's a stronger stimulus. Um, and most of the cells, in responses to these uh, random textures, like, uh, the, like the sparse noise type textures, uh, respond much better. Also with white noise, they respond better to the black pixels. Um, what's next? So um, there are a number of things that should be done. Um, we're very interested in studying extra striate cortex and its contrast sensitivity, contrast preferences, since the major input to the ventral stream is coming from these layers which have a black preference. Um, we're also quite interested in trying to understand uh, in greater detail with, with uh, theory, and this is a case where theory might be of some help, how we could get this great amplification of the black preference in, um, in the output layers. And in general, laminar models of the cortex would be great for, um, uh, um, we think, would be necessary for understanding um, its function. And in general, what I would say also is the last thing, actually, this is probably most important, but I almost forget, but, uh, but related to my, my spiel for in our earlier uh, seance, um, uh, the view of the, of the primary cortex is acting as a bank of filters that's presenting some kind of filtered image to the next level, which is doing another level of filtering, which is presenting a filtered image to the next level, and then someplace a bell rings, and you go ding, 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 you know, it's a car, or something like that. Um, I think that view... Uh, needs to be um, heavily revised or, or uh, dropped. And uh, this is my motivation for thinking that, because the, the, the output from the V1 is not going to be just simply a spatially filtered image of the world. It's going to be, they are tied to location. So the question about location, that locations are probably pretty closely invariant. But the, the spatial filtering is changing with the stimulus ensemble. So. Uh, basically, the message is going to be some pattern of activity which is in some way connected to the, to the patterns in the visual world, but um, loosely. It's not, it's not invariantly connected or, 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 or derived from it. And therefore, the way that pattern recognition could make use of this kind of signal, it seems to me, is only by comparing some pattern of activation. Uh, I mentioned this in his talk. Some, doing some kind of pattern matching of the population code, population distribution of activity, to some stored population of activity that you then can do some kind of matching for. So, um, so I think that we have to get away from the idea that there are neural images that are being passed off, that the homunculus is looking at a neural image. There is no neural image. It's sort of it's 10 different images, depending on what, we, what, what, the, what we're looking at. And so we need a different way of thinking about how the primary visual cortex can be integrated into a scheme that allows us to recognize patterns. That's what I think is the big thing that's what's next, is coming up with a scheme that makes sense in terms of what 
the primary cortex is doing. So that's all I have to say for now. Thanks. I really can't say because I don't understand it enough. I have to say that. Um, so it's, it's discriminative instead of generative in general. I mean, in fact, to discriminate between two opposites rather than generate some unknown image from. And discriminative filtering is very different because we really look only for the differences in two, between the two patterns of the expected change. Try to test rather than receive everything. So. Um, I think I, can, I okay. need to do this offline. That's all I would say. But it sounds, you know, right. uh, certainly we need different ideas, and that's one of them. And I think it's a candidate. Fine. Yeah. So this is all first order analysis. The answer is no. So the, the second order effect that you're talking about would be interesting to look at, and I, I agree with you completely. But we didn't, the answer, the answer. But, but it's uh, definitely a good idea. So I'm trying to understand the, the relation between the black or the blackness and the, and the change in the shape of the receptor. Yeah. You said that that's simply. That's what, you know, uh, that, that's a good question. Uh, uh, they, um, I mean, you haven't shown that they are so here's causally related, that the two effects are there. Um, it's true. I mean, two things are happening. There's, bo there's both kind of expansion and change of uh, shape of the black regions, and there's also absence of the white regions. And, uh, and we, don't, we haven't dissected those. That's correct. So, th that, so I didn't show, but uh, something I stated, which was that you know if you try to predict say orientation selectivity from this uh, uh, this sparse noise map, you actually you can get a, a preferred orientation, but of course the selectivity is very low, and the preferred orientations are all over the place. So so it's true the, the shape is changing as well as the polarity, and uh, we do not have a mechanism for that. That's correct. I mean this is just an observation. Absolutely right. Does it depend on? Well, see, we have, this is the nice thing about this is the nice thing about layer four C. We have a control, so we actually can show that our definition of gray and means that in layer four C they are equivalent or close to equivalent. Not not quite. They're not perfect, but it, it's very close. So it, there's not some kind of way. And also, we have some reason to believe that you know basically um, the white contrast and the black contrast were matched uh, in terms of effectiveness because. But four C is our best argument, because there isn't a gigantic difference there uh, in the responses to black and white. And so if we were way off on you know, the, the definition of contrast, uh, 4C would have shown the asymmetry, and it didn't. So that's our bioassay. Yeah? Would the flight times are important? Yeah, so I didn't show the dynamics, but there is a change. Uh, and um, generally speaking, the white response is delayed in the sparse noise compared to the black. Uh, but it's not much, and, and uh, it's like, a f like one frame off. Um, I don't know what else. To, I mean, I don't, we don't think it's a huge effect, but I, uh, I don't know. Um, I, I wouldn't say that, that the dynamics are drastically different. They're, they're quantitatively different, unlike the spatial maps, which change uh, drastically. So um, um, th the... Um, um, you know, it is true, I mean, one has to say, it is true that, that uh, one of the, the differences uh, between the, the grading stimuli and the uh, dot stimuli is that the overall spatial contrast is quite different. So there is a much higher integrated spatiotemporal contrast in the case of the 
what we call the Hartley stimuli versus the dot stimuli, which are, if you look at the pattern, actually it looks like, you know, almost a ghostly screen because it's mostly very low contrast. Most of the screen is gray most of the time in those. Mm -hmm. And so there is, we're not equilibrating for contrast at all. Uh, but, uh, so it could be that, you know, if there were a contrast-related effect, uh, that that might change the timing a little bit in the way that we see. Um, uh, there was something else I was going to say about contrast. Um, other um, schemes for correcting for uh, the, uh, the, 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 the linear receptive field hypothesis involving what are called contrast gain controls or normalizations, I mentioned this in his talk, um, would involve changes of the uh, time course or of the scale, but wouldn't involve changes of the shape, or at least you have to put in special mechanisms to do that, which haven't been proposed. So some kind of, you know, you need a very elaborate kind of mechanism which would look different from the ones that have been proposed so far. So it, it's a different kind of thing that's going on, which is why I said some kind of selective change of connectivity. We think probably cortical-cortical connectivity must be involved. So this is where recurrent excitation may become very important, for instance. That's not, that's not, actually, I don't think that that's corrupt, that, I don't think that's right, actually. I think that you can, if it, if it was really the, if it was really the linear, it was really the LN model, I think they could be significantly non-Gaussian to get the same answer, as long as they're uh, white, as long as they're, as long as they're uncorrelated as, 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 as I'm, it's, I mean, part of the reason why um, that's not probably a big deal is because everything gets Gaussian inside the retina. So it's not, it's not, you know, if we're all Gaussian underneath. It's, even if we're out here, we're, you know, separate. So it, I, I don't think that's a serious concern. Um, Non-white would be a serious concern if they, were, if they were, if they were correlations. But as I said, we, these were specifically chosen to be orthogonal basis sets, so they're not. Another question is whether you know whether these cells can be described one by model with more than one uh, linear projection. Yeah. So, uh, so it's. It's actually, theoretically, in principle, you can always approximate anything with a, enough uh, summed. Uh, so the answer is, of course, yes. The question is whether it makes any sense, and I, I think um, that remains to be seen. But I don't think so. But th but because they are qualitatively so different, you need to add a lot of extra terms. But you it, see but the when you yeah. Well, this is the big effect is in simple cells. Yeah. Um, it may be, but I think it's, it, may, it could be explained in a different way, but it m might be. Um, uh, I think that, that I, I, I don't know the answer. I haven't really run any model tests, but I think it could be different. Uh, um, because again, as, as Heim just pointed out, um, this effect you already see in, si in simple cells. It's gigantic. In fact, I've only really been showing you and emphasizing the simple cell data. The complex cells as a group See, the thing is, if you were, if you were dyed in the wool, Hubel and Weasel fan, you'd say, well, with complex cells, you shouldn't expect to get anything because they're so nonlinear, you won't get any first order response at all. But in fact, in many of the complex cells, you do get spatial maps. And then what you find is that they're completely uh, changeable. They, so there's huge dissimilarity with the complex cells. And, um, um, and the answer is, uh, but, but you can get it also with simple cells. So it isn't really related just to the complex cells problems, although they have their additional and they seem to be, you know, very uh, non-predictable and non-invariant. Non I'd like to make a comment and a question. The comment is on your list of effects of that black. Uh, it's beautiful. Uh, you're doing I didn't say that. I didn't say that. As you're putting words in my mouth. Many years ago, uh, Seema Shekhtar and I did work on apparent motion ah. uh, and signals for apparent motion, part of which you were involved in, part of which Peter was involved in. And there also we found that black was a stronger signal than white. Okay. Well, I don't remember that. <laughs> Sorry, Shaul, I don't remember that. <laughs> we, we quoted the Seaman and uh, Vance. Uh, well, you were much more responsible than I was. Uh, but, um, uh, okay. uh, and the question is... I, mean, I shouldn't have responsible. You were much more on the topic than I was. 
um, the, um, th th this effect, this tremendous effect in, in, in to three. Um, so first of all, people have claimed that there's a change in receptive field properties in the surround being stronger or weaker, you know, depending on contrast. So that is a kind of change, although a minor one compared to this. I'm wondering if you think that... Yeah, it's true. So, so contrast can change like the receptive field size and so on. It's true. That's another failure of the receptive field hypothesis. I agree. Um, uh, it's just that, you know, that's been around for 10 years. But people still talk about receptive fields, receptive fields, receptive fields. So my feeling is, you know, um, with this, it's really hard to maintain that you can talk about a receptive field. But, but it's true that there were earlier indications, some of them from my own lab and some of them from your lab, that indicated that uh, there was something uh, that was not right. But, but it still didn't stop us from talking about it. So I have to say that, that um, it's only now that I realize, you know, um, it's like they say in the, in the Haggadah, only at 70 years uh, uh, do I finally understand what the meaning is. Of the so the question, though, is do you think that the, the differences here and so on relate to just a nonlinear receptive field, some sort of linearity here, or is it in layer 2, 3 because of feedback from other layers and that's what's creating okay. it? Okay. So I can speak to that very specifically. Um, it is a nonlinearity, of course, but nonlinearity is a kind of a generic term for all the kind of things that can happen. This is, you know, uh, there's nonlinearity, and then there's nonlinearity, you know, that kind of thing. But then also, um, uh, this is almost certainly not due to feedback, because the sparse noise where we're seeing this gigantic uh, change, these stimuli are tiny little dots. They're very ineffective for driving feedback. So, th so there might be feedback coming in to play with the grading stimuli, but those are sort of like the conventional, you know, Gabor type uh, pattern. So, um, my feeling is that. But there is feedback involved in the response to the, to, probably to the, to the gradients. There is some component of their response that it, these very elongated things might well be due to feedback or, or things from recurrent connections. But, um, but this, this uh, asymmetry in response to black and white, I think, is probably generated in, in, within V1 itself locally because there, the, the feedback would be very weak to such stimuli.